understanding is on the federal securities laws, there, there is not merit regulation. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. It's a matter of degree. Um, when you uh, require, for, for example, there, there are instances where disclosure can veer into merit regulation, depending on whether the, the requirement is simply to provide all investors with all material information about the company. That would be pure disclosure. Um, requiring specific disclosure about specific topics um, that, or re, re, requiring companies to comply with substantive standards that are not simply about disclosing to investors all of their material information, then you're veering into merit regulation. Well, I, I, my understanding, and again, it might be outdated, is that the SEC cannot refuse a registration because they object to a business model or anything else. They just can require you to spell it out in excruciating detail, and that's not merit regulation. So I, it, it's setting up a sort of a straw man, I think, and saying, well, the fight is against merit regulation and disclosure. I'm for disclosure, but not for we don't have merit regulation. Let me, Dr. Sherman, do, we, do you consider us we have merit regulation here for federal securities laws? No, I don't think so, and that's very important. Uh, having seen uh, a lot of other countries, particularly in Asia, they give investors much less information and instead rely on uh, metrics such as has the company earned a profit for the last three years, and if not, you can't go public. And uh, it closes out a lot of good companies and yet doesn't improve pricing because people don't have enough information to judge. So I think a strength of the U.S. is that we do have disclosure and not merit. And because of that, the, the, there is a strong emphasis on very thorough disclosure. And as Mr. Trotter points out, it, could, it leads to long prospectuses. But my, my feeling, and, and I'll ask both you and Ms. Beyer, is that these perspectives are read rather closely by very sophisticated institutional investors, in, in particular in preparation for IPO, so the information is not just gratuitous or ignored. I mean, frankly, if I was presented 200 pages or I would <coughs> quickly, uh, Evelyn Wood would be proud of me. Uh, but uh, when you have these roadshows, when you have this process of iteration, that these perspectives ultimately are, are very, very useful, I presume. Is that accurate? Well, I think so. I, I tell my students in my IPO and venture capital class that you get more information when a company does an IPO than at any other time. There's just so much in the prospectus. And when we do case studies, we go through the risk factors, and they'll have stories and extra detail. You find out a lot more about how the company does business, how the model works, from all of that detailed disclosure. And you don't necessarily have to read all of it, but you can look through and look for what you need, and hopefully it's there. So I, I think that's very important. I'd hate to see us loosen that. Ms. Barr, your comments. Uh, yes, as an institutional investor, we would read the prospectus cover to cover prior to meeting with the company so as to be able to use the meeting time most effectively. There's a tremendous amount of information available, and yes, it is written sometimes in arcane form, but it's, it's tremendously important. And brings up another question about the JOBS Act in that, of course, people now have, in, investors have less time to study the prospectus given right. that they can now be filed confidentially. Yeah, one of the, what's your reaction?